Good morning, good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will read you. Yeah, we're going to have to, all right, we're going to have to wake the church up at early service here. For those of you who have heard me talk about the Next Gen Preacher Search Project before, you're probably aware of a couple of things. Earlier this year, the, uh, earlier last year, rather, the Barna Group, which is kind of the George Gallup of the religious world, led by a great guy named David Kinneman, did a study for us on the health of ministers. And we found a couple of things that were interesting from the material that the Barna Group surfaced. One was that ministers in many cities were thriving and, and doing better personally, spiritually, than some might have guessed. Ministers were staying in their pulpits longer, and by that I mean staying in ministry longer. The average tenure of a minister was longer than we would have guessed. But there was another factor that we kind of didn't see coming, that the average age of ministers in churches across America is 10 years older than it was just 20 years ago. Now, in demographic terms, they say that is a significant number. While we might say, well, what's 10 years older, what that means is that we are not having as many young people come into ministry. It means that there are churches that might say, we'd love to have somebody younger. And the minister there is actually ready to say, man, I'd love to, to have somebody come in to mentor or to serve with me or to take this position and follow me. But they're just not there. Which poses an interesting question. Why? I suppose we could blame it on the young people, which is handy, and so let's just go there. They're just not spiritual. They just really don't care about spreading God's word or evangelism. But then when we look at the research on this generation, how excited they are about engaging with caring for others, how much they love community. In fact, they even love older people. Can I get a weak amen from the older people here in the audience? Come on, wrinkled homies, join me here. <clears throat> Research is showing that, that gray is in. Another thing, they're one of the most positive generations that they have surveyed in years. I'm talking about here the, the uh, millennials and the Zs are, are, are just extremely positive about the future. We are more negative than they. So I don't think it's fair for us to say, oh, these, <clears throat> those youngins just don't care about these kind of things. Which leads me to a couple of maybe tougher answers. One is that we may not be encouraging our young people to step into leadership to step into using their gifts early. I get a lot of, you know, pats on the back and, oh, you know, love your preaching and this or that. I need to tell you that my father used to grab us. Well, grab is not appropriate. We were voluntold, I think, is, is the way that goes. Hey, I want three or four of you young men to give a little lesson on a Sunday night coming up. Now, when I say young men, please don't think seniors in high school. We were 12 and 13. And the congregation was gracious enough to let us do batting practice on them. Somehow, we have gotten, and, and now I just need to be careful, some personal opinions, maybe into the point of thinking that, oh, things just have to be so perfect, that on a Sunday morning, having a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old give a few comments before the Lord's Supper would just maybe scare a church. Or maybe we're, we're just looking right past them concerned about our own needs. And I'll have to confess, that's, that's too often me. Last but not least, I wonder if we don't want to realize we must lean into the gifts and skills of this generation. It's not a matter of this would be a nice thing to do. Where will we turn? And if you want your grandkids to have, quote, great preaching, and we need to start opening the doors of opportunity for younger people. I'm thankful that Pepperdine University supports that. And I need to say, in all fairness, 
that the students you're about to see are supported by a project which is called the Next Gen Preacher Search. Lame name, I just admit it, but that's what we came up with a few years ago. And the Next Gen Preacher Search was a co-sponsored and continues to be co-sponsored uh, ministry of a number of our Christian colleges, including uh, Abilene Christian University, Lubbock Christian University, Oklahoma Christian University, as well as Ozark Christian College and Cincinnati Christian College and, um, uh, oh my goodness, now I'm going to be shot, Central uh, College of the Bible in Moberly, Boise College uh, up in Boise, Idaho, as well as Pepperdine University. All of these colleges working together, and by the way, that's independent Christian church colleges as well as uh, Acapella Church, church of Christ colleges working together to say, what can we do to raise this generation up? Each one of them submitted a little five-minute video. Uh, they were one of, of many we've had uh, over, I think the number is like 200 and some odd at this point. Students give a little five-minute video, and if you say, where are they from? They are from all over the country. And if you go to Facebook and look up nextgenpreachersearch.com, if you, rather than looking at cats dancing or, you know, what the latest uh, kid's accident on a bike is that everybody's laughing at, uh, go to nextgenpreachersearch.com and be encouraged at young men and young women who are sophomores, juniors, in, in high school and college students from all across the country. I hope that you here this morning, or you watching this online later, will say, well, man, I've, I've got a nephew, I've got a grandson, I've got somebody that I know that could do this. John's words that I repeat so often to these days are, in 3 John, fourth verse, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking according to the truth. I have no greater joy than that, which is why it gives me such great joy to introduce to you four young people from across the country. Um, our first speaker uh, is going to be uh, Alex Goff. Uh, Alex is a student at Ozark. Did I get it right? Alex, he and his wife are, are here today, followed by Jennifer Gash. Jennifer Gash is a high school student from right here in Malibu, California, and we're thankful to have her here with us. She's part of the university church. Um, Gary Robinson will follow. Uh, Gary uh, is a former student at Mid-Atlantic and uh, lives all the way across the country. And I want to say Carolinas, but it's not, is it? It is the Carolinas. Okay, good, I got it right. And Silas Moe comes from up in Oregon and is a student at Boise Bible College. Each one of them are going to speak on one of the books that you've already heard spoken about a bit from our scrolls, but maybe in a little different way that you, than you've heard it. Let me encourage you to be encouraging to them and let me ask God to bless them as they share. Would you bow with me? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we just ask this morning that you would uh, give us a lift, God, as we listen to these four gifted young people, as uh, their words penetrate our hearts. And God, that as we are reminded of the power of youth, God, whether it was David with his slingshot or Joseph's faithfulness or the way that you used a group of pretty young men to follow Jesus. Lord, may we be more aware of our need to follow you and Paul and not looking down on those who are young in the faith, but rather, Father, encouraging them. May we be encouraged and may they be. We pray this in Christ Jesus' holy name and all that agree say, amen. Would you make them welcome, please? All right, y'all, it's, it's early, so everybody go ahead and stand on up. We're going to wake up a little bit. Everybody shake it out a little bit, shake it out. All right, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, what's the point? Okay, go ahead and have a seat. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a homework assignment for this lesson. When I point to you, that's what I want you to say. What's the point? So let, let's go ahead and try that. Perfect. I want to tell you about a time I was saying, what's the point? 0, 0.00. That was my batting average in first grade. Now, for those of you that don't know baseball, that means I didn't get a single hit the entire season. I was the worst player on the team, by far. Like, the, the pitching machine had a better, better batting average than I did. It was a little embarrassing. And I remember it was the last game of the season. 
And my coach walked up to me and he got down on one knee. He grabbed my shoulders, shook me a little bit and said, Alex, you're going to get a hit. And outwardly I said, yeah, okay, coach. Inwardly, I was thinking, what's the point? What's the point? Co coach, why are you even telling me this? You know I'm not going to get a hit. What's the point? What's the point? That may be our reaction when we read our core verse today found in Ecclesiastes. Um, you can go ahead and listen or it'll be up here on the screen. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. What's the point? Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. And you may be thinking, well, Alex, that, that doesn't sound pointless at all. In fact, that sounds perfectly reasonable. You have to understand the context of the book to understand why we're asking, what's the point? A Hebrew word we see over and over and over in the book of Ecclesiastes is this word hevel. Everybody say hevel. Hevel. And when we translate this word hevel, it can mean a couple of things. It can mean emptiness, meaninglessness, vanity, or smoke. Smoke. And, and all throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we, we see this teacher figure, Kohela. We've already talked about him a little bit. And he's trying to answer this million-dollar question. And the question, the question is this. What guarantees the good life? What ensures stability no matter what? And man, he looks everywhere for it. He looks, he looks in relationships. He looks in money. He looks in pleasure. He looks in wealth. He's trying to grasp this good life. And every time when he tries to grab it, he can't. It just slips right through his fingertips. He's trying to find fulfillment. He's trying to find something stable, but he's building it on smoke and it just collapses on him. Anyone here today ever try and find fulfillment in something other than God? You end up empty-handed. I know I have. But come on now. We're at the Pepperdine Bible Lectures. You all know this. It's where the book of Ecclesiastes goes next that is truly shocking. It, it talks about fearing the Lord. It talks about keeping commandments. And it says that this is the best way to live your life. We all should be doing this. But does Ecclesiastes say it guarantees the good life? Does Ecclesiastes say it ensures stability no matter what? The startling answer it gives us is no. Guys, let that, let that sink in a little bit. You could be the perfect Christian. You could read your Bible 24 hours a day. You could pray seven days a week. You could do everything right, but does that spare you from disease, hardship, and death? The answer it gives, no. And it's with that in mind that we go back to Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the duty of mankind. God, I can do all of these things and my life could still stink. What's the point? And the answer is actually found in the next verse. Let's read Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Have you been striking out recently? Are you carrying a burden you can barely carry? Has life dealt you a bad hand? I don't know what it is. Maybe your church is struggling. Maybe your attendance is dropping and you feel like you're doing everything right. Maybe there's a disease, an illness in your family, and you more than anything wish you could just take it away. And time and time again, when we're in the midst of this smoke, the statement that we keep going back to is, God, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve all this smoke. 
Ecclesiastes gives us a different perspective on judgment. What Ecclesiastes tells us is that in the midst of our smoke, God comes down to us. In the midst of our weeping, in the midst of our tears, he puts his hand on our shoulder and he whispers the words of a caring father. He says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. I I know, I know this smoke stinks, but I I died for you. And I know you don't deserve it, but I died for you. And if you put your trust in me, you can hope for a better day. A day where there is no smoke. A day where I will wipe every single tear from your eye. But the Bible doesn't stop there. We shouldn't just hope for a better day. Christians, we are called to be firefighters. We are called to work in the midst of smoke. And if we refuse to do our job because we don't like the smoke or we don't understand the smoke, then we won't work at all. To be a Christian here on earth means we're just going to have to work in the midst of life's meaninglessness. But hear me, there is a world out there right outside our doors that is choking in the midst of meaninglessness and you have the only hope that can save them. The only hope. And that's that Christ died to clear the smoke. And so church, church in the midst of smoke, the point is that God loves you. Church in the midst of smoke, Christ died to clear the smoke. Church in the midst of smoke, You are called to be a light in the smoke. And when you work in the midst of this smoke, you might be surprised where it takes you. Go with me for a moment to graduation. Not graduation from Pepperdine University. Graduation from Woodcrest Preschool. At my preschool graduation, the principal announced the students' names and aspirations as they crossed the stage to receive their diplomas, their preschool diplomas. Here comes Tommy Brown. He wants to be an engineer when he grows up. And his parents would clap, take pictures, so on and so forth, until it was my turn to cross that stage and receive my diploma. Here comes Jennifer Gash. She wants to be a mom when she grows up. And people laughed. And I didn't get why. I didn't see what was funny about being a mom. I had always wanted to be a mom for my entire four and a half years of living, and I didn't see why that was funny to anybody. Now, at that time, I had no idea that God would call me to something that I had never considered or grown up thinking about, and that call was the call to ministry. And maybe this is why I feel so drawn to Esther. When Esther was about the age that I am now, She was chosen out of a large group of young virgins to be the queen. Now, this wasn't some honor the way we see it. Being a queen meant that her life was in danger. In Esther 4, beginning in verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this, God chose Esther to be queen, to fulfill a specific purpose to save her people. Now, if Esther had not chosen to do this, then the Jews still would be saved because the God that we serve isn't limited by human decisions. But God chose to use Esther. Continuing in verse 15, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. Esther is willing to subvert her will to the will of God's in the face of death. 
And this reminds me of Jesus in the garden with his father when he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Esther and Jesus both trust God's will. And in the same way in the Lord's Prayer, we are called to do the same thing when we pray, not my will, but yours be done. My kingdom come, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If I perish, I perish. In the same way that God called Esther, he calls each and every one of us. He reaches out to us and offers us the chance to serve him with the help of his Holy Spirit. Now, next to Esther's, our callings may seem ordinary. Thousands of lives may not be at stake, but obeying God is never an ordinary decision. What I didn't know at my preschool graduation, but I do know now, is that God has called me to preach the gospel. Now, along this journey, I haven't always felt supported by my extended family and my friends, but I know that God has called me to this. And though my life was never in danger as Esther's was, it still took courage to respond to the call because I was afraid. Now, we are all called to the same thing as followers of Christ, to serve him and to show others how to do the same. But we also have specific callings. This could be our vocation or at a certain moment in our life. This could be anything from accepting a job or moving somewhere or even just talking to somebody, whatever it is that God is calling you to at a specific moment. I want to leave you with a question and three things to consider. My question for you is this. What has God called you to for such a time as this? What is God calling you to today, right now? What time is it? Anybody? Nine o'clock. What is God calling you to at nine o'clock on May 5th? Number one, know that you are called by God and he wants to use you to accomplish his will. Number two, remember that it's okay to not know what you're called to. Pray to understand the call. God might be shouting, but he also might be whispering. Esther had the Jews pray and fast with her. And in the same way, when I first felt called to ministry, I prayed, I read scripture, and I sought the guidance of those wiser than me. Number three, be bold and say yes to God. Isaiah 6, 8 says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord calling, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Step out in faith. And trust that the God who called you is standing right beside you. And the prophet Jeremiah knew this very well when he was in a dark time. Murderer. Murderer. You have just not committed murder. And now you're standing before a judge. And the accusations are not in your favor. But they don't understand you were just trying to protect yourself. Do you deserve pardon or punishment? If I could, I want to take us back to the Old Testament concept of the cities of refuge. Now the cities of refuge were six Levitical towns chosen to protect those accused of murder from the pursuit of an avenger. See, back in Old Testament times, if a person committed murder and killed another person then by law, the family of the murdered could exact vengeance on the murderer. But if the murderer could get to a city of refuge, he was safe. He was protected until a fair trial could be held. I've come to tell you today that the love of God is our city of refuge. Let's face it, we're flawed. We're humans, we make mistakes. The Bible says that in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody excluded but the Bible also says in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. So that means everybody who's ever committed sin deserves death. And I believe the devil understands this concept a little bit too well because he's going to first tempt you into sin. And once you've fallen, he's going to drag you before righteous judge Yahweh and say, this man, this woman deserves death. And he's right. We do deserve death, but listen to this. Lamentations 3, 21 through 23. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. See, what the devil didn't understand is that merciful God already had a plan in motion. He knew Adam was going to fall in the garden, and that didn't stop him. Like Jennifer said, that God isn't stopped by human decisions. 
He had a plan in motion. What is that pl plan, you may ask? Not what, but whom? His name is Jesus. Jesus came to planet Earth, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and he walked among us, wrapped in flesh, and he dealt with every trial and test that humanity has ever had to face, and he passed with flying colors. And because he passed, that qualified him to die on Golgotha Hill that Good Friday, destroying sin, death, hell, and the grave forever. But that's not the only thing that he did. Can I tell you what we, he did? I'm going to talk a little bit Pentecostal. We need to get some life in this place. Can we go for a second? That's not the only thing he did. He didn't only cleanse our souls, but when he bowed his head and he died and he gave up the ghost and they pierced him in his side, that was symbolic for an opening of an establishment of an eternal city of refuge. When he bowed his head and he died and he went into the grave and the veil tore in the temple, destroying the barrier between God and man, that was an establishment of the eternal city of refuge. So now, if any man be condemned, if he be defiled, if he be broken, if he be sinful, all he has to do is come to righteous judge Yahweh and plead the name of Jesus. And he's allowed access into the eternal city of refuge. The Bible says in Romans 38 through 39, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to open up that first couple of words if I could, for I am convinced. In some other versions it says, for I am persuaded. While I was preparing for this, the Spirit of the Lord asked me, Gary, how do you become persuaded by something? How do you become convinced by something? And I was like, well, God, in a court setting, if a lawyer wants to prove that his client is innocent, he's going, to produce, he's going to produce and present proper evidence to the jury that proves that his client is innocent. Am I right? So I want to look at this from a spiritual aspect. Persuasion comes by proof. So if we were in a court setting right now, I would call the writer of Romans, Paul, to the witness stand, and I would ask him, Paul, what makes you think nothing can separate you from the love of God? And he would tell me, Gary, I was a murderer. I used to terrorize the church of God, and I had no problem with it. While I was on the way to do more killing of Christians, the Spirit of the Lord met me on the road to Damascus. And instead of striking me dead, he changed my life, and he moved me from being a murderer to a missionary. That's why nothing can separate me from the love of God. I would sit him down, and then I would call the woman from John 8 to the witness stand and ask her, Woman, what makes you think nothing can separate you from the love of God? And she would say, Gary, I was in a predicament. I was in a problem where I was about to be stoned to death by a group of religious leaders. And instead of getting Jesus' permission, he stepped in and pleaded my case and saved my life. That's why nothing can separate me from the love of God. I would sit her down and I would call Zacchaeus to the witness stand. I would say, Zacchaeus, what makes you think nothing can separate you from the love of God? And he would say, I'm a grimy, slimy, no good tax collector who stole people's money and had no issue with it. But when I got hungry for God, the verse that started going through my mind was Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is still near. And I got hungry and I climbed and I went to a position that I would have never gone. I climbed a sycamore tree to find him. And instead of Jesus passing me by, he stopped and said, I'm going to your house for dinner tonight. And he changed my life and gave me an experience that no silver or gold could ever give me. I would sit him down and then I would call Peter to the witness and I would say, Peter, what makes you think? Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And he would say, Gary, I did not our Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. And when I was ready to call it quits on ministry, when I was ready to throw in the towel and go back to my old life, God met me where he first called me, on the sea of the shore of Galilee. And he reinstated me and he met me in my place of brokenness with a posture of healing. See, sometimes that's we have, why we have to remember our first altar, because sometimes we have to go back there. To remember how we consecrated ourselves. Because it's easy when we get older to get away from that first altar. But he wants you to get back to that first place of consecration. So he, he reinstates Peter. I'm going to sit him down and I want to call you to the witness stand. Can I do that for a second? I want to ask you, what makes you think nothing can separate you from the love of God? And I want you to remember those times where it was dark. When it was no peace, when there was no hope, when there was no light, when your finances had dried up, when they said that you were going to die. And I want you to remember how God came and he switched the report, how he turned things, how he restored you. I want you to remember that and I want to use, use that as evidence against your next giant. 
I want you to use that, and I want you to present that to your next giant and tell that giant, you're not taking me down because that didn't take me down. Cancer, you're not going to kill me because my finances didn't kill me. Devil, you're not going to kill me because the home front didn't kill me. You're going to present that to your next giant because persuasion comes by proof. So that's why the devil hates your testimony more than he hates the blood of Jesus. He hates your testimony more than he hates the blood of Jesus because when the blood of Jesus and your testimony comes together, it becomes a weapon he can't stop. And we get verses like Revelation 12 where it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their, help me somebody, testimony. Come on, somebody. When your testimony comes together with the blood of Jesus, it becomes a weapon that the devil can't fight against. You know what the Greek word for testimony is? Martyria. Martyria means evidence. Come on, that was supposed to be hit harder. It's evidence, it's proof. When you live as the proof of the power of the blood of Jesus, the devil can't stand it because you are light and salt and leaven to the world and somebody in chains can see that that person got free so I can get free and you introduce them to the blood of Jesus. So if I was to sum up this whole sermon into one sentence, it would be this. God's love is not only affection, but it serves as your protection. God's love is not only affection, but it serves as your protection. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never ceases. It doesn't matter what you've done. It'll never cease. It doesn't matter what you're fighting. It'll never cease. It doesn't matter what the doctor said. You're, it will never cease. God loves you. Yeah, we don't deserve it, but he loves us. And sometimes we forget that. But because he loves us, it doesn't mean we won't face hard times. It's because he loves us that we face hard times. And I want to invite the last of our speakers, Silas Mo, to tell us about God's love. Would you please make him welcome? Don't get your hopes up. <laughs> no, seriously, don't get your hopes up. That's what my brother told me when I was a kid. And I know some of your siblings said, hey, shoot for the stars. You can do anything you want. But when I told my brother that I wanted to be an astronaut, he said, hey, Gumby, why don't we just rein it in here for a minute? And why don't you just try and have your shoes tied by the end of the day? How does that sound? And when I was 18, I was like, yeah, sure, I can do that. You see, it doesn't take much hope to look into the future and expect tied shoes. Unfortunately, we use this word hope for other things as well. We, we look into the future and we see that it's foggy and we don't understand it. There are shapes and shadows out there that are scary and, and we say, oh, I hope that maybe I could have that car or I hope that I could have that job or I hope that I could communicate the lesson that way. We take hope like it's a coin that we flick into a wishing well, but it's empty. It's hopeless. We don't expect it. If there was one person in history who had an excuse to be hopeless, it was Jeremiah. And yet, he found it. But he didn't find it in the confusing nature of the future. You see, the thing about the future is our human eyes, we don't understand it. We can't see past right now. I don't know what I'm eating for dinner tonight, and I couldn't tell you anything about what's going to happen tomorrow. But the past, yeah. I remember that. Jeremiah turns to the past, and when he looks back there, he finds something special. In Lamentations 3, 21 and following, he says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. In the middle of lament, hope, on either side of these verses in Scripture, we see some of the most gruesome things in the Bible. People who are so oppressed by the burdens that are on their back and the chains that are digging into their wrist that they die. And people who are starving to the point that when they look down, they see the curvature of their own bones. And mothers who are so desperate that they eat their own children to survive. And here's Jeremiah. 
watching this, watching his friends and his family and the covenant community of God go through this. And he finds hope. Jeremiah wasn't focusing on the curses of the covenant that they had established with God. He was focusing on the love, and he found hope. And in doing this, I think Jeremiah exercises some of the worst driving advice I've ever heard of. When I drive, I like to have both hands on the wheel, looking where I'm going, focusing on the road ahead, because if I don't, I'm going to get in a wreck. And when I'm riding my bike, I have to have both hands on the handlebar, looking ahead at where I'm going, because if I don't, I'm going to get in an accident. But Jeremiah, he he, he turns. He takes his eyes off the road of the future ahead, and he turns to the steadfast love of God, the covenant that God made with his people, and then he's brave enough to walk into his future, but looking into the past. And he's not turning his head over his shoulder all the time saying, oh no, exile's coming, I'm so scared. He says, I have hope because of the steadfast love of God. Christians, we face the same future. It's foggy. We don't understand it. It's scary. There are shapes and shadows out there that we don't understand, and we take this this coin that we call hope, and we go, I hope that maybe one day. But what if we turned? What if instead of looking over our shoulder all the time and getting scared about what might happen, what if we fixed our eyes on the covenant, steadfast love of God. The cool thing, Christians, is that we don't just look back to a covenant that Jeremiah looked back to. We don't look back to a God that just separated the Red Sea and just gave them the promised land. No, we look back to that and more. We look back to a God who died on a cross for you and I. And I don't know about you, but I don't just hope in tied shoes 20 minutes from now. I hope for something greater. I hope in something greater. I hope in someone greater. We all hope in a God who resurrected from the dead and will come back to greet his covenant community again. We hope in the midst of life's meaningless smoke. We hope when we're called somewhere way out of our comfort zone. We hope because of God's unceasing love. And when you look at a hope like that, I dare you, do get your hopes up. So, what do you do now? Uh, I'll give you three things. One, will you pray for these guys? In a couple of weeks, uh, we're going to travel together to the North American Christian Convention, where they're going to speak in, um, I want to say it's Cincinnati. Is it Cincinnati or Kansas Kansas City? City? Kansas City. Kansas City. After that, they will zip across to Lipscomb University in Nashville, where they're going to speak at summer celebration there. Uh, We're continuing to look for other opportunities, and let me invite you to invite one of them to speak at something you've got going on at your congregation. And I I, I want to say, in fairness to these four, that there are, uh, we could have the stage filled up with 12 students uh, who were involved over the last uh, three years. And if you look online, you're looking for a youth ministry intern or maybe someone to work with your congregation uh, in future, let me just encourage you to consider reaching out to someone who who is young and, and early on the path because you can be a blessing to them. And I believe they'll bless you. They call it reverse mentoring. There's even a term for it these days. You say, what is reverse mentoring? It's when you get your junior high student to fix your phone. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's what reverse mentoring is. I want to pray over these uh, four students. Uh, I, I want to answer two questions that I get asked. Uh, well, now, who writes their sermons? Uh, no, they do. Uh, they prepared these, they prayed over these. I do want to thank those here at Pepperdine University, like Dan Rodriguez and Tim Willis and, and uh, uh, Doug, uh, Doug, Greg, Greg Dom, thank you, uh, and Barry Fike, uh, and others who came and spoke uh, with them and coached them. Mike Cope was another help as well. Uh, but, but all we did was blow a little wind under their wings because these guys are loving their walk with God, and I believe it comes out when they share it. Can I get an oh yeah from you on that? Amen. Amen. 
so, uh, so you know what? We've, we've, we've got enough. We've got enough folks we can do this. I see, I see the vicar. I'm part of the, the minister at the uh, university uh, church. I laughingly call him the vicar. And I see uh, one of the elders of that congregation as well. And I bet there might be another elder to here. I see Rudy. Uh, sitting over there. Could I ask you guys to come up and just put your hands on one of these guys and we're just gonna we're just gonna pray over them and as difficult as it is <laughs> Yeah, Jim, that's really not fair, but I'm gonna let you do it anyway For those who don't know Jim Gash has his hands on on the shoulders of his daughter right now <laughs> And if I start crying, I will not be able to pray. So that's why that is not okay Right <sighs> Will you bow with me? Lord, in faith, we look into the future. We envision what you may do with young people, just like those standing here on this stage. Father, they are not here because they're the best or the greatest. God, they're here because they love you and they want to be used by you. Father, like so many others that are sitting in this audience or that are wearing uh, shirts and serving all around this campus and across the nation, we thank you for a generation of young people with faith and optimism. But Father, today, even as uh, some brothers older than they lay hands on them even now, for today we ask you to give them courage as they face the bumps and difficulties and frustrations and maybe even criticism. Lord, we ask that you fill them with your spirit and commission them, that this is one more step on a journey to you using them in ways that will honor you. And God, may they always remember, and may we all be smart enough to give you the credit when good things happen, and to, to remind ourselves it's not about us, it's about you. Bless these students and so many others like them, and may more be raised up to be teachers ministers, missionaries, servants of yours. Father, may more be raised up to be uh, doctors who preach and uh, lawyers who teach and moms and dads who are teaching and serving and counseling, who are living out Jesus. And come, Lord Jesus, and then we'll just all go home to the mentors who shaped us. But until then, help us to be more like you. We pray in Christ Jesus' holy name and all that agree say, amen. Thank you for being here this morning.